Welcome to the Leaders Mindset, where we bring you illuminating conversations with leaders who are making an impact in business and our communities. Thank you for tuning in today. Today, our guest is a good friend of mine going all the way back to our days as Air Force captains here in Las Vegas. We're going to save some of those stories for another time. That's a different podcast for sure. But he's a good friend of mine, and he's also the Libertarian Party nominee for the United States Senate race in Maryland. Please welcome to the podcast, my good friend and soon to be yours, Mike Scott. Thank you, Jason. How you doing, man? I'm good. It's good to see you. I don't think we've we've talked like this in um, what it wasn't like texting back and forth in a couple of years at this point. So it's it's been a while since I came out there and saw you. Thanks for yeah, having you me. You need to come back out. You need to come back out for sure. Uh, so thanks for being with us today. So before we get into the politics, and I know you want to get into that, and I want to get into that too. What have you been up to up to since I left here in left Las Vegas in 2007 to go off to other Air Force assignments? What did you do in the Air Force afterwards? And then what were you doing after you left the Air Force? 2007. After 2007, I left Vegas. God, when did I leave Vegas? Ah, I went to Korea in 2008. So I went over to Korea and we were doing, uh, I mean, we were measuring and prosecuting how we would run the air war in Korea. So I was doing stuff at the AOC, the air ops center in the strategy cell. I was the operational assessment team chief. I measured how we were doing. I set up games and, and war games and figured out how we prosecute the war and measured how they did on their ATOs and stuff. So that's all really boring stuff, but I measured stuff. When yeah, we it's, war games. it's kind of boring stuff because I was in the in the chaos at Al Yadid doing stuff in the so, Stow Cell, command and control for capabilities, yeah. and it's it's really boring stuff, but it's kind of important stuff because I think a lot of civilians and even a lot of folks who haven't been in an AOC or an operate a jock and a joint operations center or any kind of operations center out there, they kind of think that like a lot of this stuff is happening in real time, like mm -hmm. in the movies. Mm -hmm. Or like Star Trek, right? Something happens and you immediately react and, you know, heroes, yeah. villains, that kind of stuff. And that's not really how we prosecute wars, right? There's that's... a lot of building things ahead of time, being ready, knowing what our targets are going to be. When a new target pops up, we, us we usually don't go hit it immediately. There's an intelligence gathering function. There's a strategy function like like you were doing in your AOC of what's the value of taking this target out? What are the pros and cons of doing it? How, do, how does it impact both our adversaries and us if we take this out? What's the impact to our intelligence capabilities? All that kind of stuff. So I, I, I don't want to dig in deep into that at all, but I do want people to understand it's not like the movies. It's not, not where things just pop up and we go hit them immediately. There is a really deliberate process for the most part, except for real crisis situations, in planning and executing uh, both an air, air war, land war, uh, surface war, undersurface war for, for the Navy. Um, that's another podcast where we talk about joint operations. So we could, we could talk about that for hours, but one thing you did say, I mean, we have a couple contingency plans. Like we had plans for non-combatant evacuations, not a chance, by the way, there's too many Americans over there to get them all out. Oh yeah. I mean, we had plans for all of that stuff or a lot of that stuff, but there was the unforeseen. And on my favorite thing to say was the plan is nice, but the plan is nothing. The ability to plan is critical and key. And like you said you were in the stow cell. A lot of people don't actually know what that means. That's special technical operations. That's the crap that as I worked with the stow cell a lot. We had to have an understanding of those capabilities and how we'd employ them. And that's what folks don't understand. The military teaches you how to plan and how to use the available resources. You take a good gander at how things are, the, the state of the situation, the order a battle, the blue, red forces, whatever. And you put together a plan to get to your goal. And that's, that's what I've been doing for a hundred years, man. That was my whole lot in life. But after Korea, I went back to Las Vegas and I was working with uh, a joint test, an electronic warfare joint test called JEPIC. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they did a, a lot of really cool, I just can't talk about most of the stuff we did out there, but I will say everybody thinks it's all super secret and crap, but it's all physics. It really is. It's all physics. It's all electronics. It's, there's only so many thing waveforms are going to do and it gets really boring, but. It, it's but, so boring. I, I spent well, most of my career working on those kinds of programs and, and it's, 
it's so it's so boring. You're, well, it's it's neat when you're doing it because you see the capabilities of it, but you work in a dark room with no windows and old, you know, sixty year old AC, and you all got you know <laughs> problems breathing and catching. It's it's exciting and fun, but it is it's amazing that it becomes day to day and mundane. You know, I've I've actually sat in the cockpit of an F twenty two. They didn't let me fly it because that would be hilarious too. But short sighted you know. jerks. I've, I've gotten the chance to do things most folks would never do. So yeah. after I retired out of Nellis, I, uh, I went to the NSA, actually, the, the Navy component of NSA out at Fleet Cyber Command, and I was trying to figure out how to build the naval budget, but that job was absolutely terrible. You really need to get away from DOD for a while if you've been in DOD 20, 22 years and you want to come back as a civilian. You have to go away long enough to get a civilian mindset. So with that in mind, I ran overseas and uh, did training, you know, setting up training uh, curriculums, evaluating training curriculums, evaluating students and crap. Did that for a while, then came back, came back from overseas. And I worked at the, uh, well, I tried real estate, I tried a couple commercial jobs and ended up back at the Office of Government Ethics doing compliance across executive agencies, trying to figure out if they were compliant with respect to the ethics rules and understanding what those ethics rules entailed and telling people how they're doing and offering them opportunities to fix the bad stuff. So that, that brings me up to current. I quit that job because of Hatch Act to run for office. Well, it sounds great. I definitely wanted to get, get into that. One of the things I always like to ask our veterans, whether they were in for one tour or a career like you and I were, how did your transition out of the military go? What were the what were the high points? What were the low points? What's advice you've got for for folks transitioning out of the military? And also, what's advice you've got for employers who are hiring people who are transitioning out of the military? For people getting out of the military, I'm more practical in my approaches. Uh, there are things that people will do to you because you don't know it. Like we had one guy that worked for us. He got out. He was very good at electronic warfare. And I found out later on he was making the least amount in the company because somehow they used his retirement income. Oh, if you add your retirement income, you're making definitely over X amount of money. And and so a lot of them will use dirty tricks to negotiate with you because you don't know any better and you think everybody's above board. I suggest taking the tap class at least twice. It's some of the information is silly. Some you won't want to sit through, but the, the uh, transition assistance program is phenomenal and there's nothing else like it. And the next thing is to know your worth, because if you don't know your worth, if you don't know your value, if you don't know how much you should ask based on your skill set, you will get underpaid and they will take advantage of you until you learn better. Uh, the, the other thing is don't underestimate taxes. I actually got a, on paper, 30, 40% raise when I started, you know, all money coming in after the retirement cut my pay in half. I got a 30, 40% raise on top of that. It should have put me at damn near 150% of my salary. My take home was less. <laughs> oh, we get a lot of nice benefits as military. So oh. understand that taxes are serious and you're going to say, I know, but baby, you don't know. So no, you, you, you don't. It's a, uh, until, uh, even if you're getting retirement pay, until you get that first retirement paycheck and you see what a difference it was from your last active duty paycheck and you go through that first first tax season. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like you have you have no idea. And I know everyone tells you this. Please listen. Um, just like and and I, I tried to listen and prepare and it was still and it. There, there are all these little adjustments we have to make when we take off the uniform. This is one of them. Mm hmm. I don't know if anyone can ever truly be prepared for this one, but do what you can to prepare yourself for us. So I don't well, think the, you and I. The other talk thing, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, the other thing that gets you is in the military, everybody seems to be gung ho and ready to go forward, charged to get the mission done in the civilian world. I mean, I, they don't quite say it, but it sounds like later for you, cornbread. I ain't, that sounds like a you problem, baby. I ain't doing that. So people won't necessarily come together for what's best for the mission there's a bunch of bull crap in fighting. So yeah, that you got to get used to. It's an adjustment. Um, you're going to hear a lot about culture, especially if you go work for uh, uh, a big modern company. 
mm -hmm. in out in the civilian world and what they say by culture is a lot different than what we had wearing a uniform. Now, I don't think you and I have ever talked about this, so I'm interested in this answer. What made you put on the uniform in the first place? I mean, just like most folks who put on the uniform, my father was military. His father was military. My uncles were military before them. I, uh, I came from the south side of Chicago. I didn't have a lot of other choices. I tried going to college, realized I hated it, so I enlisted. And when I enlisted, I had folks telling me what to do that I wasn't really impressed with a lot, you know, people with bars. And I said, how the heck did you get your uh, commission? And they said, oh, I went to college. I said, I'll be right back. So I went and got my commission. Because <laughs> that's how I've always been. I don't necessarily know the, uh, the whole path, but I try to learn the next step. Once I know the next step, it's hard to stop me. That, that's all you can do sometime. It's, it's nice to... Yeah. You know, what's the Mike Tyson quote? Everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. So they get and, that's, yep. and that's a lot of what life is like, even in the military is, you know, you have a, a career plan and something happens and yeah. that's all upended, but you can still follow through on the next step usually. Yeah. Now, in your time in the Air Force, you were pretty close to some pretty important decision makers. What did you learn about leadership and strategy from some of those decision makers? <sighs> Okay, so that's, that's oh my God, that can go on for an hour. That right there could be an hour-long question. I got time. Um, the best thing I learned was none of them are perfect and none of them are any smarter than you and me. In fact, Jason, you I keep wanting to call you by your uh, call sign. <laughs> your, uh, yeah, you can. I don't think the audience has heard it before, but that, I'll have to do a video explaining that at some point. Uh, no, we don't. We'll leave it. <laughs> but... It's one of those things where they aren't any smarter than you or me. You and I are actually smarter than most folks I've sat in the room with who are decision makers. They were decision makers because of who they knew and deals that they made. And that was cool and all, but they have information at a much higher level. The reason they were really great leaders, though, is they didn't wait for the 100% solution. If they got as much information as they thought they could get to make a good decision, they made a decision and it wasn't always right, but it was always a decision because you and I have both heard the term analysis paralysis or paralysis by analysis a dozen times and actually making a decision and starting is, is hard. So the fact that they did that was good. And the fact that they understood the difference between enough information and too much, because sometimes waiting for too much was bad. So one error towards action. Two is have a decision-making rubric, have, a, and a, have something like the military teaches it. Find a way to actually make decisions. The military, the Air Force teaches the OODA loop. There are several different MDM, MA, uh, MDMPs, military decision-making processes. Air Force used the OODA loop, and it was just fine, but it was a framework for making good decisions and understanding a process for it. So having a process for making decisions is also important. So a rubric and air towards action and the ability to take large amounts of data and figure out the best path forward. You know, it's more of an art. So, yeah. Uh, if you're, if you're watching this and you've never heard of the OODA loop before, it's a, uh, it's an old air force concept. We still, we still talk about it a lot. Cause it's a little simpler than a lot of the other decision-making protocols that are out there. But uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, it's, Observe, okay. orient, decide, act. Yeah, and it's observe, orient, decide, act. I've legit been in, in corporate boardrooms and seen people giving you leadership training, and it's word for word out of uh, Airman Leadership School or, or SOS, and I'm laughing about it because they paid this guy thousands, and I could have just pulled something out of my phone right now and gave the same briefing. No, so it's, it's why such I have good company, so. Yeah. But it's, it's training that they use for individual engagements between police officers. It was originally started by uh, Colonel John Boyd, I believe his name was, and it was to help fighter pilots get within the decision-making process of other fighter pilots. But they use it, they sprinkle it on everything. It's like Frank's Red Hot. It's, yeah. We used it to plan promotion parties. I mean, the OODA loop, getting through the process, it's just a process, so. It's simple and powerful, and if you don't skip steps and you iterate, you go. You always go back to the beginning and start yeah. observing again. Yeah. It 
it can be incredibly powerful for you yeah. and, and really just help you work through one step at a time uh, and iterate and iterate and iterate and get to first get to that 80% solution that's going to really move the ball forward and then refine it to where you're to your 100% solution. Observe, orient, decide, act. Exactly. It's called the OODA loop. Definitely worth looking up if you're looking for some tools in your job or your career to help you with decision making, help you with turning strategy into action. Yeah. And, and that's the hard part, getting strategy into action and taking all the disparate pieces and putting them all together and figuring out a way forward. So, yeah, I, yeah, the OODA loop is a good thing. So uh, any other lessons you learned from wearing the uniform that you've taken forward into your civilian career and ventures and especially into politics? Have a thick skin. <laughs> I swear to God, you've sat through fighter debriefs, right? Oh, yeah, I know where you're going with this. I, go ahead. Have a thick skin, man, because because it's not personal. It's you look at things as they are. People will make fun of you. People will say the worst things in the world. Don't chase a lie. Don't react every time somebody pricks you or cuts you because then you'll be swinging all day. You have to have a thick skin. You have to be able to cut through the noise and get through to the message. If somebody's insulting you, is there something in this insult that has weight that I can actually use to improve? If somebody's blowing smoke or complimenting you, is there something in this that's true and relevant? You don't look at things how you wish them to be or, or how you fear them to be. You look at things the way they are and don't worry if people are yelling or if they critique you. If you screwed up, I screwed up, I own up to it. What do we do next? So have a thick skin and don't take it personal because it's probably not. Uh, their insults have more to do with them than you. Yeah, we have, we have both sat through those air crew briefings um, with fighter pilots, with some of, the, you know, some of the most direct, blunt, um, tell it like it is guys. And I think just from observing is from the outside, mm -hmm. it's nothing compared to what goes on in politics. You, I give you a ton of credit for having the thick skin for politics because I don't think I have it. Uh, it's it's nothing compared and and yeah the the world we live in today is the those fighter pilot debriefs or or air crew briefings were nothing compared to what we're seeing today so so good on you for having the thick skin and keeping at it i've, I've been called a racist i'm like dog you know how black i am today what the heck <laughs> i've been called a racist i've been called a nazi i've been called a liberal a spoiler insignificant I've been called every cuss word you can you can find, and the honest worst thing you can do to a politician, because technically I guess I'm a politician now, but I loathe the title, is ignore them. And that's the hard part out in this area is the knocking on doors and having people go, oh, you're not a Democrat, and just laying in you with both feet when both sides are making life worse for everybody. But I'm yeah. not going to get political. This is a leadership thing. <laughs> well, I do want to get into some of that, um, but you know, be, be, because you, I, I prefer the term because I know you, and I don't think of you as a politician. I prefer the term running for office. I'm, I'm running for. I, well, my my tagline is DC. I I was a math major undergrad. My tagline is DC. Don't need more politicians. They need mathematicians because they don't seem to understand. We're borrowing a hundred grand a second. A second. I've done the math too. So let's get into it. Let's get into the politics. What's behind your decision for running for office? And I, I suspect based on some of the things we've talked about already, where some of it comes from. But what, what's, your, what's the, the impetus, the drive for you to run for office? And what are some of the changes you want to bring about? So I'm looking at, I have four kids. Uh, my daughter just graduated. I missed her thing because I was at the Libertarian Party National Convention. So I missed her graduation. So I'll be out there next month or the month after to see my baby girl. Um, but I was looking at my children and all my life I've worked so that I can have a house and, and have a yard. My kids could grow up safe. And they're looking at not being able to get that same American dream. They're looking at never being able to afford a house. And they used to tell me, and I always believe this crap that societies thrive when old men plant trees, they'll never, they'll never enjoy the shade of. And to me, Nobody's fixing the problems that seem so glaringly obvious to me. And if nobody's fixing them and my children inherit this mess and I did nothing but profit off of it, 
then I owe them an explanation for that. And that's really weak. That's kind of the worst thing you can do as a man is to leave your children problems that you could have fixed had you only tried. So I got to try. So, and, and the reason you go for Senate is because, and people always ask me that, why didn't you start at the local level as a city councilman? One, screw those guys. <laughs> Cause who the hell do you think you are? But two, I've been uh, for the Navy and the air force. I've helped build the president's budget. I've helped strategic planning. I've been in rooms with ministers of defense, and, and I've actually ridden the subway under Congress already as part of my duties. The guys that are on C-SPAN handing or reading their statements, I'm the idiot behind them handing them what they're going to say because they have no freaking clue. I've been in those seats, and I know those people, and they're not going to fix it. My opponents in this race, Amazing politicians. They will con they will uh, continue business as usual. They will continue the status quo. And that's the last thing DC needs because we can't afford it. So if if nobody's going to fix it, I got to. In fact, I think I told you you should be running too. <laughs> I'm kind of mad you're not. I, I told you I, don't, I, I have I have a thick skin for being on podcasts and social media stuff. I don't have a politics thick skin, Mike. You know me. I carry a knife. I'll cut somebody if they mess with me too hard. <laughs> I, I, I've I've been TDY with you. I know you do. So, <laughs> so you talked about uh, planting trees that we'll never get to enjoy uh, as old men. What yeah. are what are some of the trees you want to plant? Let's let's understand because libertarian nominee, liber the libertarian party is by far not a monolith, and there's a lot of it's... there's a lot of um, misconceptions, misperceptions. Um, and there are some accurate perceptions uh, about there about the Libertarian Party. So what kind of Libertarian are you and what are some of the changes you want to make? What are some of those trees you want to plant? Okay. So the first part of the question, what kind of Libertarian am I? I got, I got to go back a couple steps. We got Magatarians in the party who love Donald Trump. We got Green New Dealitarians who are all about the liberals. We are a collection of autistic folks, anarchists, uh, rebels, and, and folks who genuinely believe that the government is too big and we're going the wrong, the wrong direction. That's all we have in common. I mean, I know people who are straight up racist in the party, and I knew people who, who are for pretty much everything, including Scud missiles. It's, it's really a crazy mix, and it's a great group of folks when you get down to it. Because all of us believe that there's the right way, the wrong way, the American way, and my way. All of us want our way, but we don't want the government to be enforced, to enforce our way, if that makes sense. We want you to be free to have things your way as long as you're not doing wrong. So I am a blackitarian because <laughs> I'm a black male, and I firmly believe that to an oppressed people, small government is the closest thing we can get to freedom. And I'm a constitutionarian because I believe, I mean, we all swore the oath several times. Every time we were promoted, every time we will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. And the people that are in charge aren't. So before we can figure out how to heal America, which I have a plan for, we have to heal the federal government. My first bill is going to be term limits. We need a new uh, round of BRAC, base realignment and closure because we have 1.3 million, I think, active duty troops, something like that. We've got almost 300,000 reservists, and they're using our almost 500,000 guardsmen as reservists. So we're in 700, 750 bases in 80 countries. We need a lot of our folks brought back. We need to stop spending money overseas. I need campaign finance reform. There's a bunch of stuff to get we're in an abusive relationship with our government. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff we need to bring power back to we the people. So term limits will help. Shrinking our military up will help. Shrinking the federal government will help. Does that mean I don't believe in feeding the homeless? No, it doesn't mean that. There's a guy named Chris in Baltimore from Trinidad. For half a million dollars, he has five, five employees, and he feeds as many people in his community as the Maryland Food Bank and their top four employees combined salary is north of a million dollars. So for the salary of two folks in the food bank, he's feeding his community because he decided to. We don't believe that government 
where we believe government isn't the place to feed folks and house folks. We don't believe that it shouldn't be done. Push that down. What was it? Chain of command. Push things down to the lowest level to be effective. It just makes sense. So, so those are the things I would try to do. Those are the things I would try to do first. I, I did. You, you talked about uh, post wearing the uniform, you worked in Office of Government Ethics. And I'm wondering if anything you saw there kind of contributed to this is the direction you're taking. So I did. Uh, we don't. We don't even know if I can say this to, to protect. I, I, we can protect the innocent, but. Well, I had a finance. Okay, they had me reviewing someone's financial disclosures. This lady was a billionaire with a big B, and I'm looking at this thing like I'm not a forensic accountant. What do I know about her her finances? And they're like, oh, just go look through it and see if anything conflicts with her position. And I look at him again, and I'm like, dude. This, how am I supposed to know? And also, she voluntarily filled this out. Why would she put something on here that conflicts with her? They're just, man, go through. And so I went through and I researched it and I did uh, as good of a job as I could, but I realized how ineffective the entire process was, at least for that section. There are things that need changing, and you and I both know that government's way too big and way too fat, and their only job is to grow. There's a lot of things that should be changed if you really want to talk about controlling ethics in the federal government. I mean, I, I don't know that OGE, I think they could be effective. I don't know that what I was doing felt effective, if it makes sense to you. I felt like I was pushing papers. Yeah, no, I, I remember uh, when I was stationed at Maxwell teaching Air Command and Staff College teaching at the Practice Command course, and we did our module on ethics. It was always, you know, ethics has to start here. It has to start with yourself. It's about the example you set, the, you know, the the character the character of yourself, and you can't expect other people to engage in yep. what we consider to be positive ethics if well, the, it's not modeled for them. Well, it's, it's actually three steps worse than that because I heard a figure, it's something like 60% of generals move on to the defense industry. And they go on and they become VPs or executive VPs, whatever the hell they go do for a gazillion dollars a year. And then you go look at all the people. If you go Google $100 million uh, DOD corruption or DOD whistleblower got a $60 million settlement, you'll see half a dozen examples accidentally. That means these people are going over to, to DOD industry and they're being corrupted by the money or they were corrupt while they were in. And you and I both know folks that got to positions of leadership, their generals, you know, just because of who they knew and, and, and the relationships that were formed. And it's kind of dirty and incestuous. We need a top down ethical review of a lot of stuff. And uh, I got the military guys to do it because I was in that world. I know a couple of sixes who would be great at it. Just like when I wanted to know about PPBE reform, planning, programming, budgeting, and execution, I know a young lady who I was stationed with 100 years ago who's on the freaking commission, so I went and asked her. Just like I wanted to know about the importance of post offices, somebody I'm friends with runs a few of them out in Tennessee, so I went and asked her. I'm at the worker bee level. I've worked my whole life. I've made the connections, even at government ethics, through the different agencies where I can do some damage if I get in there. Cause like my opponents are better politicians than I'll ever be. I've forgotten more about acquisitions and top secret programs and federal processes than those people will ever know. And, and I do the job better than them because I understand the math too. Well, and, and you and I both know where the rubber meets the road in how those programs are run from when we started just as lieutenants all the way up through the end of our careers, working our way up through that system. So oh, no, know, one of my babies you know flew. Works. I saw one of my babies flew the X 37. We called it the space maneuver vehicle before that. So, you know, that I was doing that as a lieutenant out in LA when I was a rocket scientist. I remember I, I had a business card that said that. <laughs> I remember. Well, so, I'm yeah. sure campaigning has been a new experience for you. What are some of the challenges besides needing to reinforce that tough skin? What are some of the challenges that maybe you didn't anticipate before you started campaigning? Well, honestly and truly, I didn't think I'd have to campaign. I thought the Republicans and Democrats were messing up so badly that if people had a viable alternative, they would jump on it. 
But it turns out that people are wed to the processes and they're wed to these programs and, and people are wed to the, the, the fear of it. Cause they always ask me, Oh, what are you going to do? And how are you going to fix it right now? And I'm like, I got, I got to get into the position. So I know the gazintas and gazadas before I can actually give you that answer. I have plans, but what will those impacts be? Time will have to tell. And they get afraid of doing something different. And they are actually beholden to the system that's broken and making everything worse. I don't understand people paralyzed by fear, not being willing to try something new. And I don't understand people who sell out for money when what we're approaching is hyperinflation. So there ain't enough money in the world to actually sell out for. So I don't understand what people are doing, but uh, the hardest part is reaching every door. I don't have enough legs. I don't have enough people to reach every door in every neighborhood. So I'm trying to be impactful and figure out where the best, where my best investments are. Cause it's a zero sum game. So I have All to right. make it when I, when I spend money, it's gotta be hitting because I can't, you know, I can't afford, I don't have millions of dollars to spend on a campaign. And if I had millions of dollars, I wouldn't spend it on a campaign because that's not what millions of dollars are for. Well, if you're watching this and you want to volunteer to help out Mike Scott for U.S. Senate, we'll have his contact information in the show notes and you can reach out and actually you should just reach out and talk to Mike. Oh, yeah. Mike Scott 2024.com. I get all those emails and I've been known to make fun of folks when they ask me silly questions. So and I do. Part Which of my is Mike language. Scott I know and love. I, I do shit post on Twitter quite a lot, part of my language, but I am quick <laughs> to put out something on Twitter that's <laughs> hilarious. So it's at Mike Scott one word if you go on X. All right. Well, speaking of hilarious, let's play a game. This game is called Rapid Response. I'm going to give you a question. Go, go. You're going to give me a rapid answer. So maybe it's the first thing that pops into your head. Maybe it sends you down a rabbit hole. It's okay. We're looking for honest answers to get to know Mike Scott a little better. Honest. Honest answers. Okay. Honest answers. Rapid response. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right. Mike Scott, rapid response. Your time starts now. <laughs> Podcast recommendation. Uh, I'm a fan of Rogan. Okay. Joe Rogan, best summertime picnic food. I refuse to say fried chicken. <laughs> uh, I, I can't say watermelon either. Say pass. 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 I knew you were going to say that. Something we should all be paying attention to. Uh, our leadership. Our political leadership. Okay. Don't answer yet. Either your Get Psyched Up song, or you actually probably have this for when you make appearances, your walk-on music. My original walk-on music was The Man Right Here by Mystical. Lately, I've been going with uh, Flavor Game Changer. Nice. Uh, it's spelled Game Changer DK, but it's spelled Game Changer Dyke. But it's uh, Game Changer Flavor. <laughs> Your biggest influence in life? <sighs> I, I, I can't go religious with it. I mean, you can. Lately or all time? Um, why not both? It's your episode. Oh, God. I, I don't have a rapid response for that. Um, my biggest influence was probably my mother and father growing up. If you mean politically, I was always a fan of Lincoln. I know a lot of people hate on him because he was a Federalist. But, yeah. And... And I'm a fan of Frederick Douglass, real fan of Frederick Douglass. I have to get back to that. I don't know if that's a rapid response. Wow. All right. My biggest we'll, influence. We'll, we'll I like Alan that. Watts. Hmm? Go, set, go ahead. I like Alan Watts. He right. was a Buddhist, and that's where I've been, you know, trying to focus on lately is staying away from all the extra noise out there. So. All right. I, I think that's great advice. Stay away from the extra noise. A book everyone should read. Oh my God, there's about 10 of those. Becoming Your Own Banker is a game changer if you read it. I think his name was Williams. Uh, money, 
and the Law of Attraction. I think Vicky Robin wrote that. Um, Gabor Mate, The Myth of Normal. That blew my mind. And Oprah Winfrey's What Happened to You. God. Uh, Pimp by Iceberg Slim. And you got to go with, uh, I mean, God. Idiot's Guide to Economics is probably a good one. Uh, that's a great one. And I think I need to reread that one again. I think, uh, yeah. I think with the coming election season, we should all probably take a look at that. We should all pick that up. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Best way to beat the summer heat. Pool, go to the pool, go to the beach, pool or beach. Love it. Next vacation. I'm going to Vegas, but if I can ditch the kids for a couple weeks, I'm going to actually take a hop over to England. Cause I've got four Mac terminals within two hours. And, and I'm a fan of hopping over to Europe. Uh, so for, again, for our non-military audience, taking a hop means as a military retiree, you can go get on military flights if there's space available. And I've, I've actually, when I was on active duty, I went with a couple of people who we went down to Guam to visit friends of ours who were stationed there. And it's, it's a super fun adventure, but it is kind of an adventure because when you're low on the priority list, like retirees, you don't know, you don't know when you're getting to go. You don't really know where you're ending up, and you you are never certain when you're coming back. So you know, yeah. So you don't know where you go, when you're getting there. If it's gonna stop and ditch you someplace else, when they're gonna say, "Man, we got to put somebody else on the plane," you got to get off. It's it's hilarious. I did it as a young lieutenant. I haven't gone as a retiree yet because you know, single father life is rough out here. Yeah. Well, and it, and it's totally worth it. It's it's yeah. super fun. Yeah. Uh, an important trend to watch. An important trend to watch, actually, I've been watching both sides, both Democrats and Republicans, are spouting a lot more libertarian content. They're actually listening to us because, because our message is, is honestly very appealing, and they are spouting libertarian things. So I think the trend is liberty and freedom, and you should all get on it. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. Love it. The other thing is I don't know with dating why it's so rough out there. So I don't know why, but I think people need more connection because we're becoming more and more disconnected as a people. And it's, it's not good for us not to care about others. Uh, agreed. And it's getting rough out there. Yeah. Favorite sports team. It used to be the bears, man, but I'm, I, the bears have been letting me down so long. I'm leaning on the Ravens lately. So. All right. Good to know. Well, the season, the season will be here uh, before we know it. Yeah, yeah. Can't believe it's already, we're recording this in mid June. Yeah. All right. Back to the good stuff. Back to good thank stuff. Thank you. Thank you for playing the game. We all got to know Mike Scott. I think our audience got to know Mike Scott the way I know Mike Scott. No, no, not quite. That would require tequila. <laughs> I, I do have some. I do. All right. On your campaign website, I did look. I do my research on your campaign website. You ask, why should you trust Mike Scott? And I love the answer you give there. We'll let the audience see what the answer is on the website. Then go to it's Mike Scott, 2024.com. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, but more importantly, because it's got to do with trust, why should you trust Mike Scott? How do you build trust with others, whether that's people on your team or the voters in Maryland? Consistency. My message is consistent. I want less government. I don't care if you're in the KKK. If you want less government and less taxes, I will support you. I don't care if you're Black Lives Matter. I don't care what your politics are. Uh, who was it? The Gottmans. Uh, John and Judy Gottman, they're doctors. They have the Gottman method where they can predict with 90% accuracy whether or not you and your wife will make it based on watching your interaction for like 32 seconds. I don't know how it all works. They're big into it, but they said 69% of the time you don't change your mind. Whatever you argue about day one in a relationship, you argue about day 50, day 3 million. If you're in the relationship, you're going to argue about it. People don't generally change. I'm not trying to change anybody's mind. I'm trying to get you guys on board with saving America. I have a way forward that I think will work. And my message is consistent. These are my plans. If you trust me, if you don't trust me, understand that you can trust that this is where my interests lie. And that's what you should trust is aligning interests. The last thing you should trust is a politician. And if you want to know if you should trust somebody, you ask them. If they say, hell yeah, don't trust them. 
do not ever trust somebody that says trust me. It it so. sounds like it's a lot about building common ground, uh, finding common ground, and building on that common ground. Yeah. And, and trying to do what's right, because that's really all I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to go in this for the money. I think we got way too many people beholden to money. Did I say I'm not going to take advantage and make money while I'm in there for myself? No, I did not. What I said was I'm going to shrink government and try and fix it so that nobody can go in there and enrich themselves. I'm trying to eliminate government at every spot, every chance I get, because it's the right thing to do, you know, constitution. Constitution, big fan. Any any other takeaways about leadership or building teams from your experience running a statewide campaign? I have some core values, man. My core values are integrity, loyalty, and kindness. You know, loyalty as long as it doesn't impugn your integrity. Kindness because there's not a lot out there in this world, and everybody in America seems to be, and let me wipe this off. I'm in the hot house. Everybody in America seems to be working from debt. And that seems to be our guiding principle is greed and debt. And I think love and kindness is a better place to go from because then, I mean, there was this uh, flower company back in the day. They had flower sacks. And when they found out women were making dresses out of this crap for their kids, they started using floral prints. That probably didn't maximize their profits, but they loved and cared for their customers. We're missing kindness in this nation and we're missing kindness i may dislike everything about your politics but i don't have any contempt for you as a person and that's what we're missing we can't have non-contemptuous discussions out there so we need kindness out there that's the one thing i've learned and that's why i have that's why i have core values and my toast is to us and those of our ilk integrity loyalty kindness i okay because it's it's out there it's you have to be kind especially when you don't know what's up, especially when you don't know what somebody else is going through because it's not personal. None of it is. So. I love it. I think I'm going to cut that clip and just keep posting it over and over <laughs> and over again. Cause we need, we need a lot more kindness. We need, we need civility, a- dude, education and civility. Yep. Love it. Yeah. So when you were looking for someone to be on your team, what are you looking for and how are you developing those folks into future leaders? So, I'm poaching people left and right. I keep poaching folks. The first thing is they have to be engaged. And the best place to find people who are engaged is other people's campaign teams. (laughs) Because most of the people don't. So a willingness to be engaged is the first thing. I swear to God, it really is. Because most people just want to be left alone and they don't want to be bothered. So there's a very small number of folks willing to come up and help. The second thing is they need to be more wed to the truth than being right. And the third thing is they have to believe that we can win because I've turned away a lot of volunteers. I keep, the, the state party is amazing, and they're volunteering. They're like, Mike, can I hang up signs? Mike, bring your lit out to the gun shows. So I go to the, I go to the gun shows. I go to the parades. I hand out literature. But I can't reach the entire state doing that. I need a viral moment. I need volunteers where I can't get to. And the Democrats and Republicans have that machine. So honestly, right now I'm looking for a pulse and an eagerness to help fix things. Or at least that you're alienated and pissed off because I can use that too. I'm looking for whatever I can do to motivate folks to go out and tell others. So I'm looking for zealots. And, and do you have anything you do to, to grow them as leaders so you can stay focused on the big picture? I go in and I talk to folks every day. Hell, I wrote a book for, uh, it's more of a pamphlet for my four kids. So I'm very big in leadership and development. I go through and I talk to folks. I try to make sure they understand that none of this is personal. I try to make sure that they be nice because we're not trying to cuss people out. And some of these people <laughs> deserve to be cussed out for some of the things they say to you. I try to grow them like I was grown. I try to be an example, and I try to point out whenever they're making course corrections. I give course corrections. I'm very laissez-faire. I always was. Even when I was director of ops, I think you give people a task, and you step back because I hired them for their expertise in getting things done, not so I can go, you go do this, you go do this. 
if I see them not being motivated to work, I'll try to give them a push. If I see them doing something wrong or going the wrong direction, I'll throw them a hint. I've only had to fire two people so far on the campaign, but you know, I, I am very laissez-faire and I'm very let people surprise you with, with their innovation and how well they're going to do things. You just have to keep them motivated. And with that, I just try to be consistent, be honest and hope that my light shines through. Well, I became a hippie, man. <laughs> <laughs> I think your light is definitely shining through, but it's always, it's always shown bright as long as I've known you. So what was one of the best mistakes you've ever made and how did it make you better? One of the best mistakes I ever made. God dang it. God, I made so many. <laughs> I made so many. I really don't know. I, I, I did quit my job too early. I quit the job about six months too early. But that gave me the time to reflect and think on things and plan a great way forward. And that's actually when I came up with the idea, one of the other reasons it's hard for volunteers and stuff, is I'm not trying to raise money through the campaign. I've actually turned down donations, not because I don't want the donations, but because I couldn't get enough from the libertarians that are registered to make enough impact to matter. I've told folks to their face, if selling all your assets could guarantee me a win, I would force you to sell all your assets and then make you go into hock. I really would. That's not very libertarian of you. Well, money isn't my way forward is what I'm saying. It's money's the worst way forward. We need serious campaign finance reform because the way we have things set up now, the only folks that can get in are either bought or rich. So the best thing I did was to get out and understand how these things work because I did six months of study in the lay of the land. So I quit the job early, which I shouldn't have. But getting that, getting that intel, lay, laying the groundwork and seeing what the ground truth was, was invaluable. Well, it's, it sounds like maybe you should have quit that job right at the right, right at the exact right time. I, I, I think it was the exact right time. Yeah. You, uh, you talked a little bit about your influences growing up. Uh, who is someone you admire as a leader or in business or government? Um, I, I still love Colin Powell's book. I still love what he did. He was the only one that was actually held responsible for, uh, for the Gulf War. They they made sure to hold him accountable. Everybody yeah. else got a pass. I, I, I like Colin Powell. Ron Paul has actually blown me away because I used to just assume he was racist because when I was younger, somebody said he was racist, so I never actually listened to him. But now my campaign strategy is to point at old Ron Paul videos that are still relevant and giggle because nobody's still listening to him. Um... I genuinely liked Barack Obama's hope and change. He, he, his narrative, what he said, lifted me up and made me happy. And what he did deflated me and made me a little sad. So um, I have a lot, I have a lot of inspirations, but Prince is the one I'm going with lately because he was shiny and he was charming and he filled a room and people couldn't look away. So I'm trying to channel Prince. That's my biggest, you know, leadership guy right now. Can't go wrong with Prince. We all love Prince. So you've got a lot, keep, uh, you've got a lot going on. You've got a lot of responsibility you're taking on. What keeps you up at night? What are the challenges you're facing? How are you dealing with them? <sighs> Lack of, Lack of outrage on the part of the voters bothers me, but I, I'm, I'm glad they're not outraged because they might be storming things. But lack of education on the part of the voters really does bother me. There are folks out there who do workout videos and get a million and two views, yet when uh, Representative Swiker, he's a crazy Republican dude, I don't agree with all of his his conclusions and everything he says we should do, but he frames the problem really well. In fact, I don't even do the math anymore. I go look at him doing the math. 
and he might get 7,800 or 1,000 views, man. All the people out there just were stuck in survival, were stuck in lack, and nobody's trying to fix it. And when someone talks about trying to fix it, it's ignored. It's kind of disheartening that so many people are willfully ignorant of all the problems. So that bothers me. Yeah, it's hard. It's someone who is doing a podcast and doing, you know, it's it's hard to break above the noise. It's hard no matter what yeah. your message is to, oh, yeah. to get out there. I, I understand. I mean, a chick but, was in a, uh, a white chick was in a nice outfit making dinner and dropped the N-bomb. I was laughing about it on Twitter earlier. It's got like a gazillion views because some random housewife decided to drop the N-bomb. The stuff we pay attention to blows uh, my mind. You. I feel you, brother. Besides the election, what is something you're excited about coming up in the future? Man, it's the summer. I'm going to a Juneteenth uh, parade this weekend. There's a summer concert series out at Allen Pond where folks just folks just go play go-go and jazz. I'm actually excited to be alive because with all the negativity you could focus on, this is still a time of untold luxuries and abundance if you know where to look and your needs aren't that big. You know what I mean? I, so. I, I love that you're saying that because I think, I, I know I know you remember a time when politics didn't drive the, the average American's life as much as it does today. Yeah. And the fact that you're running for office, you are in the thick of it. Like politics is your job now. And you are even saying the things I'm really excited about are going to a parade, going to a concert. Go like I think that's really refreshing. I think it's a great example for all of us of like let's let's put aside the the drama and go do some things we enjoy together. The work and the horror will always be there. And if the the best thing I did during COVID was to disconnect from TV and sports and everything. I just took a step back. I mean, you noticed it. I don't think I talked to you for like a year and a half, two years. I just I disappeared. Noticed. I was gone and I had to do that. I had to disconnect because people that I loved on my social media, I couldn't stand. I was starting to hate folks that I know what I would give my shirt to if they needed it. I was starting to hate folks that I knew would give me the jacket off their back. If I needed it, I had to get away from it all. And I think all of us need to disconnect and figure out what's important and, and shrink ourselves up so that we can actually foster human connections. So, yeah, Love man, it. that's Love it. Someone or something you're grateful for? It's going to be weird, but I'm grateful to my ex-wife. I learned a lot of stuff I really needed to learn throughout that relationship. And, I, and like you know, I've been married 800 times already and I got 17 kids. And it's, it's, it was important for me to be able to go through and figure out what the problem was. And like you said earlier, you alluded to, the problem is you. So all you can really do is make yourself incrementally better every day and try to impact your world and make it better. And those small incremental changes will, will make the whole world better. So She made my world a little better. I made hers a little better. But, you know, still exes, but it's, <laughs> it's not well, here, that bad. Here's to... Here's to moving on and all of us trying to make everybody else's life just a little bit better. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. All right. We're getting to the end. Uh -oh. Advice you would give to future leaders or entrepreneurs, especially young people who are thinking about running for office or looking to bring about change in their community. When you're making decisions, all of us make emotional decisions. Most of us have no idea that our decisions are based on emotion. Most of us don't take time to visit why we do the things we do. What I would suggest is that you use your decision-making tool, either your OODA loop or your decision-making rubric, or you run it through however you run it, but actually important decisions, go through and figure out why you're making it and weigh it and figure out what's best. You don't have to agonize over it. You don't have to labor over it. But if you recognize patterns that do not serve you, use your OODA loop, figure out why the pattern keeps happening, and figure out how to break it. That's, that's the best thing I can say is if patterns don't serve, if behaviors don't serve, 
figure out why you're doing them, and then maybe don't do those anymore. <laughs> That's really it. It's that simple. Really, really great. I, I think I, I was much later in life for me when I realized we really do, as humans, we we make decisions emotionally. And it's not that we aren't capable of rational thought and all that kind of stuff, but it's a big component and there's real science behind it. Um, so understand that and understand where your motivations and your drives are coming from and then get aligned with that. I think that's great advice. What else should we know about Mike Scott? Oh, uh, let's see. My master's degree was in the deep state, <laughs> a master's in public administration. Undergrad was math. I have been to places I can never tell you about. I've seen and done things that I could never, ever, ever tell you about. And it feels like I've lived 10 or 20 good lives. I guess that's the nature of being military. You go places for two to four years at a time and you meet all new folks and you get to reinvent yourself over and over again. So I I've had a really good time. I am not beholden to the money i'm in a comfortable position i'm not rich but but i'm comfortable enough that i had the ability to quit my job and actually affect change or try to and i'm trying to get everybody to that position where they have enough disposable income where they can actually live a life you remember your mom and dad probably had one income you took two three week vacations every year you had a car you had a tv now you need two parents to have the house and the state raises your kid and teaches them stuff you may or may not like everybody needs to heal themselves economically <laughs> educationally healthcare wise we all need to go forward and and be free and and healing helps that i think i that's lost track of where i was going <laughs> Uh, that's a great sentiment that we all we all need to heal ourselves, right? And then yeah. as we heal ourselves, we can start building that civility and connection with others to kind well, of put a button on what we've talked about. You remember the the instruments of national power. They changed it now. It's dime fill. But when I was there, we harmonized the dime. Diplomatic Absolutely. information, military, economic. So you harmonize the dime and you figure out how to manipulate folks. That's why military bases aren't just force, protect, force projection. They're also billion dollars a year to the local economy. You have to think about all that crap. Uh, the instruments for liberty, I called them healthcare, education, economy, environment, and equality. Or, you know, we harmonize the <laughs> That's my favorite joke. I refuse to be upset about it, damn it. But seriously, those are the things, those are the inter interrelated system of systems you need to address if people are going to have access to what we call liberty in America. And we don't have access to those things and people are afraid and people are broke and everything's more expensive and your government's answer is always more taxes. My answer is less government. So that's my difference. That's what y'all should know about me if you're looking in Maryland to vote. And if you're just looking to get to know Mike Scott and want to learn more about what he's talking about, Mike, tell him, tell everyone where they can find you. Mike Scott 2024.com. Uh, if you go to YouTube, it's at Mike Scott one word. That's on X also. And if you go to uh, Facebook and Insta, I believe it's Mike Scott all caps. Like actually spell out Mike Scott all caps. Yeah, we'll, I know. We'll, we'll track it down and we'll link it up in the show notes here so nobody has to remember or uh, do a bunch of work looking it up. Mike, thank you so much for joining us today. It's great to see you. I can't wait to see you when you're out here in Vegas in a couple of months. Stay safe on the trail. Thank you all for tuning in. If you like Mike, please reach out to him. Thank him for being with us today. Also, if you like what we did today here, please like, comment, and share. Send it on to someone who you think would like to hear what Mike has to say. Help us out with all the good stuff that helps us grow our audience. Um, and we love sharing these conversations with you. We're going to keep doing them. Get out there. Make an impact. Onward and upward. And I love what you do, Slider. Thanks a lot for having me again. <laughs> all right. Thanks, man. Always good right, to bro. talk to you. Yep.